What's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack from Men's Comics, and we're here like we do every week, but we're changing it up a little bit this week only. That's right. We're talking about the comic book market trends. Normally, we go three up, three down, switching it up this week, and we are going all six picks with upward trends within the comic community. A little bit different this week, huh, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. A little power of positivity. Honestly, there's just so much good going on right now in the comic market. There's a lot of stuff that's on fire. It's tough to whittle it down to just those three. Um, so this week, we got a very special kind of all up episode. Yeah, next week we might just depress the shit out of you and go down. <laughs> the all down episode, right? That's what 2020. <laughs> Not that close to Christmas. Everyone knows this is a stressful time of year. <laughs> it must be Holly, but everyone's got the stress, got the COVID, got the. I mean, everything is just 2020. That's that's a, that's a freaking verb in itself now. But uh, either way, we're gonna get right into the upward trend. Starting with the first one, we're gonna talk about HBO Max. We've talked about HBO Max on here before, but last week there was some big news, especially coming out of Warner Brothers. Yeah, huge news. And it's certainly it's one that's kind of divided. I won't even just say the comic book. Yeah, community. It's freaking theaters. A lot of people are upset about it. Um, it's movie traditionalists, etc. cetera. Um, but I think the comic community has been pretty excited about it because increased access equals increased attention. And increased attention is what you kind of need. Um, there were some good properties that have come out in the last couple of years that not a lot of people saw. Um, and some of like the negative talk about them uh, kind of swayed things. It's funny, like going through the pandemic, how Sonic, a movie that was panned early, has now been a movie that people kind of dig. Uh, Birds of Prey is one that comes to mind. People hated it early on. And Still now <laughs> I knew you'd think so. Um, and now I have come really come around on that movie. Um, and Bloodshot is another one. Now, a lot of people saw it, but people that did see it, they really liked it. Um, so I, I think that this is, is great. Uh, certainly, you mentioned the movie theaters. Um, there's there's going to be negatives of it. But the reality is a lot of it is just the world we live in because of the pandemic. I think it's unrealistic to think that theaters were going to be open full scale in 2021. Um, and it's really unpredictable when they would be. So it, it's you've got a plan for a business. And the thing to remember is these movies are still in theaters. You, if you absolutely have to watch it that way, you can. Um, but for those of us who really don't care either way, and I personally would prefer to watch it from the comfort of my home. I even think it's cool that like you can watch Suicide Squad at midnight after uh, it hits uh, HBO Max, you know, those kind of things. Um, I think that that, that is kind of cool. So uh, for me, I'm excited about it. Uh, a lot of properties, the ones that will affect uh, the comic market, um, certainly, uh, as I mentioned, Suicide Squad, um, and we'll also see Mortal Kombat released um, through uh, uh, HBO Max. That's the, one, the first one, I believe, in January. Um, other than that, just a lot of big movie titles, but it's going to be the litmus test for how successful this can be. I also think, as far as how it affects us with comics, I think it's going to further increase the popularity of Peacemaker. I may be kind of bu more bullish on him than I was, because I think that John Cena starring in that movie and then having the TV show on the same platform is going to be kind of a big deal. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I, for one, I love movie theaters. I love going to the movie theater. That's yeah. one of the favorite things I like to do with my kids, especially starting to get them into those comic book and movies and stuff like that. But I also see the plus for HBO Max. Uh, you know, I don't want to go to the theater right now, but get to see it from my own home. I'm going to miss seeing it on the big screen. If I really want something to see something that bad, I will go to the theater for it. I know a lot of theater chains are, are hurting and I understand where they're coming from when they're not too happy about this decision. But I think the viewer might, might benefit from this. I wonder what kind of pressure, I mean, Disney has already started releasing some of their stuff on Disney Plus with Pixar, with, you know, Soul and some other movies. And they're talking about, you know, Black Widow might be the next one that they announce that comes to Disney Plus. Yeah, this Wait is just on that. But if also if you want to go to the movie theater, movie theaters you can rent out really cheap yep. right now. If you get a bunch Absolutely. of stuff together, some movie theaters ninety nine dollars. I had friends that went to try to go to a movie this weekend at the movie theater and they couldn't because all the all the theaters were rented out to, to parties and families showing those older movies like you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and stuff like that. So there's different avenues. I mean, I, I think whichever one you be, whatever you want to do, see as the viewer, I see I see pros to both sides of it. I see cons to both sides of it, but I'm kind of excited. Um, it makes me happy that I actually pay for HBO Max. Yes. 
And I, I th also think you hit the nail on the head. It's only the first domino to fall because the problem that Warner was facing was this huge slate of movies that they've got to like get started on very soon um, that before they become dated. Um, every movie studio is going to have that problem. So how each of them reacts to it uh, will be interesting to see going forward in 2021. Disney obviously being that next huge domino. Yeah, but moving on to the next one, we've talked about this character on this channel plenty of times. We said it; we think it was a long-term hold, and there's been some renewed popularity over it. It's coming to the CW. It's going to get its own show, but we are talking about the resurgence of the character Naomi. Yeah, this weekend was all about Naomi. Um, I had several people talk, talk to me about this over the weekend, and it was something that I watched myself. Um, it was amazing to see copies fly off of eBay. Um, just the just sheer magnitude and volume of sales of everything, Naomi. Um, certainly, we talked about this. This is one of those like victory lap kind of moments where we said that like, if it's this is why we kind of like talk about certain principles and trends like follow the money. Um, they put so much energy and effort into the marketing behind Naomi, giving away that free comic at San Diego Comic Con. Um, the the like press that went into bringing in brian michael bendis and this very clearly being brian michael bendis's first major creation for dc comics and again this is the man behind miles morales who is arguably the hottest superhero character in comics so um i'm i'm very bullish on naomi i think that the show has a lot of potential um i think the cw verse is a perfect fun um way to introduce characters and get like layman fans and like the you know the kind of um outside the typical comic core community to be like at least educated on a character um so i look at the i think the relevance of green arrow for instance has gone up tremendously he, the sneaky thing is a lot of the attention is on naomi number one um but certainly she has a first appearance of her parents who are certainly gonna um play into the series you would imagine as well as issue number five the first appearance of her in costume that's really her first superhero appearance so everyone grabs naomi number one and i think that will always be the king and they always co grab cover a right and i think that will always be king um but i will say uh it's interesting because it really reminds me of like a Cletus Cassidy carnage situation where it isn't until issue five when she suits up that you really get the Naomi that you're investing in. Also, I would pay attention to everything Young Justice. I think if you start to kind of read the tea leaves of what's going on with the CW, um, getting the future state Wonder Woman, Yara Flores to play Wonder Girl, to have now Naomi. Um, they've had Jonah Hex, so they could certainly bring in Jimmy Hex. Um, I, I think they're starting to build a younger core of these young justice characters uh, that could easily play into some sort of crossover. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand the Cletus Cassidy argument, but I think there's a little bit difference here because you know her as Naomi. You don't know her sure. as a superhero name right now. And that first issue, I, I like issue number five, but I see why people are going after issue number one because it's yeah. Naomi number one, first appearance of Naomi. But I do see, hey, I'm always, I've even said it on this channel where I'm like, hey, I don't want to collect like the baby issues. I want to collect the issues that are what they're known for. We mm -hmm. don't exactly know what she's known for yet. I think sure. it's still coming. But right now people go for what they do know, which is Naomi number one. But it's funny also because a lot of stuff with CW catches a spike real quick. And we've seen it with multiple stuff, especially with all those other shows on CW. And then it kind of just fizzles out real quick. I'm anxious to see how this will do with the CW and hopefully I really hope that the character carries over into outside of that CW verse and into the DCU. I, I still don't think they have all their shit together with the movies and no. the TV, but I think they're in the right direction with HBO Max and everything they're doing there. Let the get the executives out of the way, get those board members out of the way, let the comic creators, let the directors, let the people that have those Kevin Feige type people for Warner Brothers and DC do their magic within that media and i think everything will be all right but well i think the positive thing about this is that you have ava divinier who is going to be behind the new gods movie as well as dmz the vertigo property on hbo so she's really starting to kind of i think become that within the dc universe so i'm excited to see that to me gives that added credence like you said yeah i know one time we were hoping jeff johns would be that character that guy and it still seems like 
I don't know what happened there. I'm not a movie insider, but it, every time you start reading about stuff, you always hear, especially from the directors, why they're doing all these Justice League recuts. It's those executive, those board members get in and they see dollar signs and then it just messes up the, 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 yeah. the comic fan of watching those movies. But the next one we're talking about for three up, we're talking about Comic Query. And this is kind of an interesting site, isn't it, Jack? Yeah, so this is fun. This is outside a lot of the, this show. Um, we talk about hot comics and books that are on the rise. One of my favorite things to get to talk about is these kinds of things, these um, additions to the marketplace that really uh, benefit the comic community as a whole. And Comic Query is a brand new website. This isn't a paid advertisement. This is something that genuinely um, we wanted to talk about. Um, ComicQuery.com is a site that essentially is trying to be a um, kind of a buyer's guide for everything in the comic community. So um, you can search popular runs, specific issues, and it will database all of the issues available uh, from various online retailers throughout the world. And this is a source that we have seen similar sort of products in like the sports card market for years and has been successful. It's been widely used. And a lot of things like that in the technology side, we tend to be lacking in comics. And it's it's great to see innovation. Now, this is early stages of the website. They're still adding a lot of new stuff, but they're very active. They're adding new stores every single day. They're looking for feedback from people who are using the site. Um, also, the site, the look of the site has changed just in the last couple of weeks, uh, has made dramatic improvements, um, as well as an excellent search bar function. Um, but this is going to be a major tool, I believe, going forward for comic specifically collectors yes but specifically those investors and speculators who the game is all about how fast you can uh find those books that but when an announcement get hits and you start seeing those prices spike how quickly can you find those books this is going to level the playing field a lot i also see some of those um speculators who hated things like the last call show from us at simpleman's comics are going to hate this website because it levels the playing field. Uh, it makes things a little easier on everybody. Um, it takes some of that legwork out of all that research of trying to figure out all of the, the various sites um, that could possibly have a book. But I definitely implore everybody to give it a check out, give it a try, um, throw some feedback out to the creators, follow them on social media. The comment query is on uh, um, Instagram as well as Twitter. Um, and these are the things I think that can take the, the comic book community collecting speculating investing to that next level yeah i think it's great i'm all for innovation i, I understand people are going to be upset about it because like you said it levels the playing field they're going to think it's lazy they're going to think it makes it easier for the comic book hunter but th that's what someone <laughs> it's like big weld from robots if you ever seen robots see a need fill a need and this person's done that with comic query a lot of people we, we say it all the time you've heard it with key collector you heard it with, kudos to them for finding that being innovative and yes. putting it to action executing on it I, I, you said it's a site that'd be anxious to know if it, you know if mobile friendly um is there an app on the way but you know just coming out out the gate right there the, the innovative We've seen it before with Legos, with uh, Brick Hunter, and there's a bunch of sites yes. for Funko Pops. Great, great point. So it's already out there for a lot of other things. It's nice to see it come over to comics. And we know there's other people that have done this on a smaller scale. Kudos to all of them as well. So anyone being innovative to help the hobby, I'm all for it. But normally we'd be transitioning to the downward trend, but we told you this week we are sticking with six upward trends. And the next one we're talking about this one got really hot last week, but we we're talking about Electra as Daredevil. Yeah, um, and I gotta be honest, I'm gonna speak negatively about this. This is this, but I wanted to put this on the down when we were originally putting this show together, um, but I couldn't because the prices are going up on across the board. On um, talking about the first print, um, on the um, the cover A, on the nullified variant. Um, on the one in 25 incentive, we're seeing prices raised. So people are on board and why not? It, it makes sense. I, I, I don't want to hear the whole like feminist argument on it because Daredevil and in, in Electra are so linked. It's kind of a natural progression. It's very much Shuri as Black Panther. Um, also the, the costume design uh, of Electra as Daredevil is dope. And I think it's kind of universally, as soon as people see it, they're like, oh, that's cool. Um, so this was a home run, no-brainer hit to me, right? Now, why am I against it? Why, why do I 
would say again, and I'm not trying to, to, to pee in anybody's Cheerios who's buying up this book, but I just think if you're buying it at the current prices, you, you're pro- shame on you for eating Cheerios. Anyways, no one likes Cheerios. <laughs> there you go. Outside, yeah, outside of infants. Um, but I think you may be making a mistake. First off, I would remind you about Chip Zdarsky's writing style and what happened with Vigil. Um, but secondly, like we've already seen solicitations for issue 27, where she's back in her regular costume. This feels very much like a very short-term thing, like a couple issue thing, um, which means it'll get hot while it's reader buzz, while people are paying attention to it. Um, and then it will drastically drop. And then to make matters worse, what really points to that is the way Marvel is going cash grab. Now, yes, you can, you can be a Marvel cynic and say they always go cash grab, right? But that's not really true. They, they've, they've milked and slow played and developed certain characters. Um, evidence of that would be look at the way that like the Donnie Cates stuff has been handled. And if you're wondering, no, writers do not have any control over that. So that's not a Donnie Cates decision. That's a Marvel editorial decision. Um, the decision to bring this book out as a second print with a one in 25 incentive um, and allowing store variants on it, including uh, unknown comics to do a virgin version of the one of the regular cover which is gorgeous art it's a panel from the inside of the book and that book ultimately the one with the trade dress will be worthless because it'll be over ordered by people trying to get the one in 25 it will be uh killed by the virgin cover that unknown does that will be the more desirable version and then there's even a uh, david mack that what when this story kind of first broke before the release of the book it broke because uh, again shout out gary nusser pointed out th- that david mack had posted some art on twitter which then that ended up getting posted by the key collector app which then got a lot of attention on it that book is now coming out as a store exclusive for the second print of daredevil 25 why would they rush that art out as a second print exclusive why wouldn't they save that for a future incentive? Well, to me, it tells me that this isn't going to be long for the world. So they're getting all of this out and cashing on whatever they can now. That's fine. Retailers will make their money and they'll move on to the next thing. They won't be hurt from this. I just would caution collectors to be careful. I could be wrong about this. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. Uh, but it's, it's kind of like what we do here is to try to give our opinion on how we see things based on our experience. And my experience is this doesn't seem like something that's going to be a long lasting, long standing thing. Um, I think that it's going to be dangerous to put the money into it um, at any sort of near current pricing. The only chance this would have of any long term success, because you guys know I'm a long term play guy, would be as if in other form of media, Daredevil was you know taken over by Elektra. But we're still fighting to see are we going to get Daredevil in the MCU? Uh, because you know the Netflix deal's over and, and there's apparently not, not going to be any more of the Charlie Cox Daredevil show, even on another platform. So we're still waiting to see. But um, that's my two cents. I, I don't know how you feel about it, Brian, but um, it, these books are definitely spiking, but I definitely want to put a caution sticker on it. What people don't know is Marvel's going to relaunch Ultimate Comics and they're going to do it with Elektra as Daredevil. <laughs> I totally just made that up. So I see it two reasons. I like this because it's a shot in the arm to comics. I've been at, mm-hmm. we've talked about how great Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil run has been. I mean, we talk about it all the time. We've even got viewers that didn't read it. They started reading it. They've enjoyed it as well. But I like that the attention that it's getting, everyone loves Elektra as a character in its own right to see her as Daredevil. I think it's a great shot in the arm, but I also, I'm cautious. I'm not going to spend all that extra money on it. But I think this is what makes comics great because this is one of those, hey, who knows? It might take off and stay up there. That's great. I'll I'll sit this one out and be happy to do so. But like you said, if it does that and fizzle out, it's going to be one of those great lessons to collectors that got on that trend, bought it, and then kind kind of, everyone gets left holding something sometime. That's why it's called speculation. That's why people do it. That's fun. That's the fun part of it. Yep. But I mean, either way, I still think it's great for the hobby. Um, happy to see, I say happy, kind of excited to see where it goes, but still a huge fan of tips that Arsky's run. But that's going to take us to an older Marvel run with another guy that's worked with Chips at Arsky. And we're talking about Matt Fraction. That Hawkeye run seems to be hot right now. Yeah. If you haven't read Matt Fraction and David Aja's Hawkeye run, I tell you, I had never read anything Hawkeye before, before I got introduced to that run. And Matt Fraction had previously worked as a a shop employee at my local LCS. 
So when I got back into comics, that was one of the first like Marvel runs I jumped into and was blown away. It's, it's so different from the tone and kind of feel of a lot of what the Marvel Universe was doing then and what they're doing uh, now. It was almost like Matt Fraction's Snake Eyes. Yeah, it definitely had a far different feel, specifically of anything that had been written on Hawkeye, especially tonally, um, as well as really taking the Kate Bishop character who had just kind of been introduced and really kind of brought her to light. And we're seeing now as the Hawkeye TV show is starting, we're starting to see on set photos, um, you're starting to see costume stuff. It's getting everyone excited about it. And it's very clear where they're pulling their inspiration from. And it's not a surprise because we long talked about how this run would be the one to pay attention to. But books are spiking all over the place. Issue number one, um, which I kind of figured would, would get popular, um, which is also the first appearance of the pizza dog. Now, you can sit there and go, it's a dog. Um, yeah, and it's, it's not, we're not talking about a super dog here. We're just talking about a dog. Um, but at the same point, um, this dog is kind of a central character within the run. That's why I was so, saying it reminded me of Snake Eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, it, that's the point. It's like, it, it's, I've heard people say that when there was talk about the new Snake Eyes getting a dog, and people were like, oh, that's not a big deal. And it's like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think you can say that, you know, because if you know anything about Snake Eyes history, like, um, you know, having his canine companion was, was kind of integral to the early stages of the character. So th this dog becomes a big part of this run and very similar to as well, kind of in that same vein of Snake Eyes is it, with G.I. Joe had that landmark silent issue with issue number 21. Number 11 in this run has a great issue that is told through the eyes of Pizza Dog. That issue won the Eisner Award for issue of the year. It was a, a really a kind of major groundbreaking issue that got a lot of attention outside the comics community. Um, and it's what started really bringing attention on this series. This is a series that was picked up like by Scholastic real heavy. Um, it was like along with Miss Marvel and Captain Marvel released at the time. It was really kind of a, a run that Marvel was really putting out there as, hey, this is a run we're extremely proud of. Uh, so like I said, issues number one, um, issue number 11, they're definitely getting attention i believe it's issue number nine with the kate bishop with the i heart hawkeye t-shirt um that is i would be almost stunned shocked if she's not wearing that t-shirt at some point in the show um that is sure to take off late printings exist for these so that's something to pay attention to issue number one goes all the way to a fourth printing and the fourth printing and the later printings are pretty affordable right now and if you pay attention to the way that late printings have been trending i wouldn't expect that to last very long so i'm bullish on this run in general it's definitely gotten some attention and it's up but at the same point i really think that just from what we talk about about reader buzz if you've ever read this this is one of those classic runs that i think people are going to want for forever um so this kind of to give it a comparison, Thor God of Thunder. It's kind of that level of importance where even the, the kind of filling issues still can command money. Yeah, another important thing about this run is it made people read Hawkeye. I mean, yeah. not a lot of people pick up Hawkeye. It's just like Jeff, uh, Jeff Lemire when he took over on Green yeah, Arrow. Exactly. It seemed like that was like DC's response almost because uh, Green Arrow wasn't doing too well either. And, he, Jeff Lemire came on there and they made a great run out of that. Because yeah, that happened right after the series came out, yeah. didn't it? Well, yeah, so it was def I definitely think that was a counterpunch. Yeah, it was like Green Arrow 17, right? I yeah. believe it was the first yep. one. But, but yeah, that's going to bring us into the last one on the six up. We should just, we, we talked about we should have made it seven up just because it sounds a little bit catchier. I don't know <laughs> where I've heard seven up before, but, you know, <laughs> but the last one we're talking about is Spider Verse. Spider-Verse everything right now, especially you got PS5, you got Miles Morales, you got King in Black, you got everything right now, Sim, you got everything Spider-Verse, everything Miles Morales, Spider-Gwen, it's just on everyone's mind right now. Yeah, and if all of that wasn't enough, which is a staggering amount of things, uh, I, I didn't even have the Spider-Verse in this, this week's show. We were going to talk about Echo, uh, the, the character we've talked about before, who first appears in Daredevil number nine from that David Mack run. Um, who is going to be a, a major, major character um, in Disney Plus who has been spiking to crazy levels. Yeah. But today we got a slew of casting news for Spider-Man 3. Um, and it really looks like we're going full Spider-Verse. At the very least, we're definitely going Sinister Six because you're looking at uh, Alfred Molina back as Doc Ock. Um, you're looking at Kirsten Dunst back um, as, as uh, Mary Jane. Um, Andrew Garfield uh, back 
uh, talk about Tobey Maguire being in discussions, uh, talk about um, Emma Stone being in discussions. So we, it, we're getting uh, kind of a full Spider-Verse and putting all of these movies together. Um, yes, it's unconventional. And it's only coming out to execution. Yes, and people are gonna are gonna criticize it, um, but to try to reintroduce characters and origins, um, it would have taken a considerable amount of time when they've already invested that time and money. And it's not like any of the actors we named are schlubs. We're talking about um, major A, a and B list actors who uh, certainly can command uh, big screen attention. The key is, as you said, how is it executed? But certainly, it's gotten attention from the comic community. People are grabbing up those uh, Edge of Spider-Verse number twos. People are continuing to go nuts over Ultimate Fallout. Um, I love the fact, but I don't even know if you saw this yet. I love the fact that all those people who've spent months going nuts about previews 95 because it's the first image of Miles Morales only to find out that because nobody reads previews, that previews 94 had one in it, the issue before. That's hilarious. Um, but still, it, it, Everything Spider-Verse has been popular for some time. I think the book to pay attention to, though, is Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, number 9, which is when the Spider-Verse story really kicks off. Edge of Spider-Verse came out before it. The free comic book that Guardians of the Galaxy came out before it. But those were telling stories from the Spider-Verse. They weren't telling about the Spider-Verse. They were giving you the introduction to these different characters. Um, the, with ASM 9, that's when the story starts. That's when everybody starts converging. Um, and that's when it's, I think it goes nine through 14. Um, but those Delato 125s are absolutely gorgeous. It's a connecting cover set. I think they're the ones to pay attention to. I think issue number nine is going to be um, a major player. And there's some first appearances there too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, everyone's, my kids still love the first Spider-Verse yeah. movie. I mean, you take the comics out of it and it's just like that. It's one of those things that's going to attract people just from that name because they used to get their... They're familiar with it from other media. Uh, my kids love Miles Morales just from the video game. My, my youngest is all about it. I mean, he, I think he puts it on at night to fall asleep to every time. But either way, you, the viewer, let us know. What do you guys think is up? What do you guys think is down? We didn't have anything down really this week. We could have added some stuff, but hey, it's Christmas time. And there's not many days left. I hope you guys got your Christmas shopping done. Either way, guys, this is Brian Jackson, Men's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.